word feral has many different meanings, but here we're using it in the sense of children who either reared themselves without human companionship or more likely were reared by some form of animal. Dr. Douglas Candland has studied the phenomenon of feral children and their alleged interactions with wild animals. He's examined hundreds of reported cases and says that most rely on eyewitness accounts and have certain elements in common. We all said the child had no recognizable speech. The child did not like to eat cooked food. The child walked on all fours. So quite properly, people were saying, this is a wild child. But just how reliable are these accounts? One of the most compelling cases in modern history comes from Kampala in Uganda. Kampala is home to over a million people who, like most city dwellers, face a sometimes difficult commute to work. But one wrong turn on these dusty roads can lead to some of the world's thickest jungle. Two hours south of Kampala, on the edge of Africa's untamed forests, lies Bombo village. It was here, in 1991, that a remarkable story emerged. A woman walking through the African brush one day was startled by a group of vervet monkeys chattering in the trees. The monkeys were a common sight around the outskirts of the village, often stealing food and bothering the locals. But as the woman watched them, she caught a glimpse of something that terrified her. A dark form crouching in the branches. The creature that caused her to run was a human boy. Later, when the woman realized what she'd seen, she went back into the jungle and brought the child home. News of the strange boy quickly spread. The local villagers felt sorry for him, but they weren't quite sure what they were seeing. Everybody came to see the new boy, who had hair all over, and he had no toe. The toe was bitten by monkeys. Children from the village recalled that when the boy first arrived, he was as wild as an animal. He could do scratch you like uh, you are not a human being. Do you know how a cat does? He could scratch you like a cat. They decided that the boy must have been in the forest for a while. Apparently, he hated to be kept indoors, wouldn't eat cooked food, and didn't like to wear clothes. And he wouldn't or couldn't talk. But the boy did seem to be able to communicate with the vervets and even moved like a monkey. He was moving like this, just like a monkey. Before long, locals were calling him a real-life Tarzan, the fictional boy who grew up in the jungle. We were wondering what kind of what kind of guy is this? It was really amazing to see such a guy making noise of of an animal. So who was this mysterious wild child? Local authorities eventually identified him as John Sabunya, a four-year-old that had gone missing from a nearby village a year earlier. To this day. The villagers believe it was the monkeys that helped this defenseless child to survive alone in the wild. It's a romantic notion, but is this really what happened? Perhaps the only way to find out for sure is to ask John Sabunya himself what he remembers. Few, if any, children who grow up in the wild are reported to ever learn language. Scientists now believe that nearly all babies are born with the ability to learn to speak. But in order to master language, they have to hear it during their formative years. For Victor of Aveyron and Kamala, the window of opportunity may have closed during their time in the wild, away from human contact. The same appears to have been true of John Sabunya in Uganda. Although the facts of his early childhood are unclear, 
It appears that the boy was deprived of human contact for a period of between six months and a year. When the young child was brought out of the jungle and into the Ugandan village as a frightened wild boy, he too had trouble making himself understood. When he was annoyed, he used to make a lot of noise, crowing like, crowing like, a, like an animal. His behaviors were different from, our, from ours. And then we wanted to know how, how is this boy communicating. He never knew how to speak, really. So did John ever learn to speak? And if so, what did he reveal about his time alone in the jungle? No one seemed to know exactly how long John Sabunya lived in the Ugandan wilderness before he was rescued. But what is clear is that during that time, and isolated from all human contact, apparently lost the ability to communicate with people. Shortly after John was rescued by the village woman, he was taken to an orphanage run by a Ugandan couple, Molly and Paul Waswa, who at any given time had up to 1,000 children in their care. But Molly admits that John was different from all the other children. She recalls the villagers' first impressions of him. People were surrounding him, trying to, he, he looked like some people wanted to have a look at him and laughing at him and thinking that he's a monkey boy. They told him he's half human and half animal. At first, Molly found the idea of keeping John in her household shocking. I said, oh my God. I told my husband, why have you brought such a person? I mean, this, this, I said, this thing will snatch our baby and run away with it. But Molly's husband, Paul, saw something special in John. He was convincing everyone in the home that this boy will become somebody. It didn't take long for him to convince Molly. I came back to my senses. I said, I must look after him like my own. Molly tried to track down the boy's family. There were a number of stories circulating around the village about his parents. And eventually, Molly gathered enough information to piece together John's story. It all began in this house, now abandoned. The mother had died, so the stepmother used to mistreat him. And somebody also said that they, this uh, stepmother might have used some African charms to bewitch him, and uh, he had to run, to run away from home. Just four years old, John left his house and ran into the darkness of the jungle. Molly believed that it was here, nestled among the trees, alone and helpless, that John came face to face with the vervet monkeys. But as frightening as that experience must have been for John, running away from home was the beginning of a new life. Twelve years later, John Sabunye is living happily with his new family. Now 17 years old, he still lives at the orphanage. In the years since he left the jungle, he's made tremendous progress. But to this day, he has trouble learning. John functions at a kindergarten level, and he speaks and understands only a little Ugandan and English. But in other ways, John has excelled. His love of running led Molly and Paul to enter him in the Special Olympics. And this has now become a passion. One of the key people in John's life is Solomon M. Weber, who acts as his big brother and mentor. Over the years, Solomon has learned to interpret John's broken language. John has become used to the urban world of Kampala. But we've asked Solomon to bring John back to the place where he was first found, to see if he remembers anything about his time in the wild. John's a bit nervous, but there's one thing he remembers clearly. Hey. Hey. Well, we're here with John, and uh, he's been trying to explain to me 
that this used to be his home. This is the very tree he was found, but it was a bit short when he could climb it. So this is the very tree where he was found. Solomon asks what else John remembers. John remembers more of the young monkeys, the small monkeys. He says that most of his time during the time, they were spending that time on eats. They were ever eating whatever they had. The reality of being lost in the jungle would surely have been frightening for a small boy. <laughs> but that isn't what John seems to remember. Instead, he recalls playing with the monkeys. John says that uh, when he was with the small monkeys, they used to hide and each one had to go and look for another one. So they were playing. It was kind of their game. So that's the, the thing they used to, to do. Eating and playing are what we might expect of the memories of a four-year-old child. But are these memories real? And would monkeys that encountered a young child in the woods really take care of him? Peter Appel is a veterinarian and Ugandan wildlife specialist. He works with a variety of primates, including vervet monkeys, the species that supposedly cared for John. And Appel has a slightly less romantic explanation as to how John survived with the monkeys. Vervets are by nature a trash species. They collect much more than they could eat. So probably what happened in this instance is that John survived on the leftover food that the vervets must have been collecting and couldn't finish. John would probably pick what was left over of that. This shifts the interpretation of the relationship between John and the monkeys. It was perhaps not the vervets that cared for John, but John who used them to survive. And as Peter explains, there's a clear difference between tolerance and caretaking. To be nurtured means that you will be fully accepted into the structure of the society. John being human, it's very unlikely that he was nurtured. He could have been accepted or even just tolerated, nurturing his... So what about John? As part of his work on feral children, Dr. Douglas Candland has followed John Sabunya's progress for years. He's now returned to Uganda to re-interview John as a 17-year-old to see what, if anything, Hello. he can remember about his time with the vervet oh, monkeys. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. It's been a long time. Candland first met John about six years ago, when he was still a young boy and had difficulty communicating. He's delighted to see that John has lost his inhibitions and even become an entertainer. <laughs> but as a scientist, Dr. Candland still has questions about John's story. People's first question is, or is this a true story? Nobody has exactly the same story, but everybody has the same theme. The recurring theme, based on the memories of a four-year-old, is that John ran away from home and was adopted by the monkeys. Candlin wants to examine John's story from the perspective of an animal behaviorist to ascertain exactly how John interacted with the vervets. He's asked John, with Solomon at his side, to piece together what he remembers. When you lived in the forest, you said there were many animals there. Were there large animals as well as small animals? He said that there were big monkeys and small monkeys. There were also snakes and uh, antelope and some other animals. Can you show me the monkeys that you saw there? And then the Zinazi one. Well, he said that the first two. He saw them. John has no trouble identifying the vervets, but Candlin wants to establish how John fitted into the complex hierarchy of the vervet community. Mm -hmm. Vervet monkeys will spend the afternoon grooming each other. It's about establishing a relationship. It's kind of like talking uh, among human beings. Did you groom monkeys? Mm -hmm. Well, the monkeys groomed each other, but not John. This not suggests that John was a bystander, not a part of the monkey group. Next, Cantlin tests the theory that John wasn't fed by the monkeys, but rather scavenged for their leftovers. Do you mean they threw food and you collected it? 
But according to Solomon, John is emphatic about this. They collected food and brought food to him. Sometimes they could hand the food into his hand, but none of the monkeys got the food and threw the food away. John and Solomon also tell Dr. Candlin that the monkeys brought water to him. But well, this is how they made the thing and they handed the water to him. But it was the monkeys who made yeah. who made this, yes. not John. Not John. The monkeys. Dr. Candlin, a 40-year veteran of working with primates, is not convinced. Few primates are capable of tool so use and verbits are not among them. Well, I think we are dealing here sometimes with some childhood the, memories. Yeah that, like all childhood memories, become elaborated over time. I think he did spend much time with monkey troops. I think he did find food that they had cast aside. He may well have found banana leaves that were still, had water in them from rainstorms and assumed that the animals themselves had done the fashioning. So when you ask, was John raised by monkeys, I prefer to say he was raised to some degree with monkeys, but I don't believe the monkeys uh, reared him in the usual sense of that word. In many ways, John seems to have survived his early experience of being lost in the jungle. But has he overcome the potentially more devastating tragedy, the abuse he suffered during the early years of his life, at the hands of people who were supposed to protect him? John Sabunye has obviously come a long way since his days in the jungle. The nurturing home of Molly and Paul Waswa has given him a second chance. But he still has difficulties with learning, coordination and language. Is this because he was alone in the jungle during the crucial development stage, when most children learn to speak? Or has something else affected John's recovery? With Molly's permission, we take John to get a complete brain scan in Uganda. At the International Medical Group in Kampala, a slightly nervous John undergoes a computed tomography scan that will produce images of the anatomy of his brain. Do you see that side? The scan could identify any anomalies or possible damage done to the brain and help pinpoint the cause of John's continued learning difficulties. Dr. Jay Geed, a neuroscientist from the National Institute of Health in Maryland, will help to analyze the results. Dr. Geed is one of the world's preeminent specialists in brain development research. And the results reveal something unexpected. In almost every way, John's brain is healthy and normal, except for one thing. The most striking feature is this dark area right here. This is a pretty big area of damage, about the size of a grapefruit. At some stage in his young life, John suffered a massive blow to the head. A pretty uh, major trauma to the brain. And the location of the trauma has important implications. This part of the brain is ground zero for language function. Understanding language, learning language, it's almost completely wiped out here. Just looking at the picture, not even knowing anything about John, I'd say, ah, this is a person who's probably going to have a lot of difficulty with language. But the good news is much of the rest of the brain is, uh, is fine. And so this should allow uh, John to enjoy life and to have an imagination and to have social interactions. The critical question is when did this injury occur? If the damage to the brain happens very early in brain development, then there's still a chance for the brain to find alternate routes, alternate connections, al alternate wiring. But if the damage happens after that's already in place, then it's much more difficult to recover function. And in looking at John's uh, brain scans, it looks to be that the second one happened, that the wiring was already established for the language centers and then was damaged. We may never know exactly when John received his injury, but we do know that it was the trauma to John's head in early life, not the effects of living in the wild, that caused the language difficulties John has today. What Sabunia's case demonstrates is that the effects of living in the wild reveal only half the story. The other half is how these children ended up there in the first place. With Oksana, Victor and John Sabunia, the important stories may be those of the abuse and neglect they suffered at the hands of their human caretakers. 
Perhaps the myth of the wild child reflects our inability to accept the failings of our so-called civilized society. John Sabunya's childhood was undeniably tragic, but happily, his future looks promising. He continues to compete in the Special Olympics, and he performs with the Pearl of Africa Children's Choir. To much of the world, he will always be known as Uganda's famous wild child. But the real story here is that of a young man's resilience and grace against incredible odds.